Infinity is one of the most difficult concepts to wrap your head around. It may seem as though I am attacking every established notion in physics and mathematics just to be contrarian, but this is not true. I simply don't see the point in expressing my thoughts whenever they happen to agree with what is already accepted. This is why you will rarely hear me expressing a view that supports the current consensus. Such a video would be pretty boring, and the consensus doesn't really need my support because it already has plenty of support. As a general rule, I would say that nearly all of what high school students are taught about physics and mathematics is correct, and it is only after graduating from high school that a typical student will start to encounter the nonsense. I am convinced that there is an overwhelming amount of invalid reasoning that has been firmly established in advanced physics and in advanced mathematics. The more I learn, the more specious arguments I am presented with, and I really cannot address all of it by myself. Fortunately, I am not alone. There are two excellent YouTubers who are also fighting in my small corner of the internet. Those are dialect and Sabine Hassenfelder. We don't all agree on everything, obviously, but we do agree on most things, and that's enough for me. There may be more of us out there, but these two have a large number of followers, and they're the only prominent dissenters who I've managed to come across. I'll now move on to the topic of infinity. The status of infinity is one point where mathematics and science diverge. The received wisdom maintains that infinity is merely abstract or theoretical, as opposed to real and concrete. While infinity remains a valid and useful mathematical concept, it is often alleged that it has no valid application within the empirical sciences. I find that it is better to think about infinity as a product of limitations rather than as an absence of limitations. In order to obtain a better understanding of the nature of infinity, it is always a good idea to think about some particular concrete goal, and then to think about how this goal is thwarted by the hypothetical presence of an infinite quantity. So for example, I cannot count all of the stars in the sky if there are an infinite number of them. Focusing on specific and practical goals keeps us grounded in reality when dealing with the subject matter of infinity. If we remove all of the relevant limitations, then we also remove the infinity. The influential 19th century mathematician George Cantor is famous not only for inventing set theory, which is now the foundation of modern mathematics, but also for changing the way that mathematicians think about infinity. Cantor argued that some infinities are larger than others. He also made a much more specific claim about the relative quantities of two different classes of numbers, which are each considered to contain an infinite number of instances. Cantor claimed that there are more irrational and rational numbers between 0 and 1 then there are integers greater than one. Cantor's conclusion seems illogical. How can something which is not limited also be more limited than something else? Influential and important as Cantor was, I don't think that Cantor was correct, and I will be exposing the fatal flaw in his argument. However, I do think that Cantor was on the right track, because, at the very least, there is much more to infinity than there initially appears to be. Analyzing Cantor's diagonal argument will help to shed light on some of the surprising complexities of infinity, including the importance of perspective. But before I introduce and then refute Cantor's diagonal argument, I will set the stage with a very similar thought experiment that brings to light the relevant concepts. Consider the statistical properties of a 7x7 seven seven matrix of random digits. 
In the matrix that you see before you, there are two diagonals, which each have the same number of digits as the rows and the columns do. Because each digit has been selected randomly, the likelihood that the digits along one of the two diagonals, which cross at the center, would match perfectly with one of either the seven rows or the seven columns of digits is extremely small. This extremely low probability is due to the fact that the number of potential combinations available is much larger than the number of actual combinations that are visible. There are 10 million potential combinations of seven digits, and each one of these possibilities has an equal chance of appearing at least once, but only 16 of these potential combinations are actually visible in this matrix. The likelihood that the exact combination of digits in one of these 14 rows and columns will appear a second time as one of the two diagonals is less than one in a million. The key insight here is that as you increase the size of this finite matrix, the odds of a perfect match occurring by chance will decrease exponentially. Therefore, as the size of this matrix approaches infinity, the probability of this coincidence will approach zero. In other words, if we have a square matrix with infinite rows and infinite columns, the exact combination of digits in any diagonal could not possibly be found anywhere amongst either the rows or the columns. There is also an apparent contradiction here because we are presented with two competing forces, but one of them has the upper hand. Each time you extend this finite matrix with the addition of one new row and one new column, 8, 9, 10, etc., you get two new chances to find a match. This would increase your odds of finding a match, all else being equal. One might think that having an infinite number of chances to find an exact match should guarantee that a match will eventually be found. However, because you must also multiply the pool of potential combinations by 10 with each additional row and column, the overall trend is that the odds decrease exponentially once all relevant factors have been taken into account. Every time the actual increases by 2, the potential is multiplied by 10. As the actual moves in a linear fashion in the direction of infinity, the potential accelerates in a curved fashion towards infinity. The actual is expanding in only one dimension, but the potential is expanding in two dimensions at the same time. The actual is increasingly diluted and drowned out by a vast sea of potential, even though the actual also continues to grow. Because we only see the actual, much of this multi-dimensional expansion is effectively hidden from view. And a special mental effort is required in order to bring this multi-dimensional expanding potential into our consciousness. If, and only if, we take into account the potential side of the equation, then we can see that it is impossible for any infinitely long diagonal series of digits to be found anywhere in either the infinitely long rows or in the infinitely long columns in an infinite matrix. The take-home points from this primer thought experiment are as follows. 1. In an infinitely large matrix, it would actually be impossible to find the exact series of random digits that we find along an infinite diagonal reproduced anywhere in either the rows or the columns of the same matrix. Number two, even though the number of visible rows and visible columns are both infinite, they are also literally nothing compared to the latent potential for unique combinations that exist behind the matrix and which will never be visibly represented to us. Now that I have primed you with the conceptual framework that you need, I will proceed to deconstruct Cantor's diagonal argument. Cantor has argued that even though 
there are infinite whole numbers greater than 1. And there are also infinite decimals between 0 and 1. There are actually more decimals to be found between 0 and 1 than there are whole numbers greater than 1. Cantor's diagonal argument is almost exactly the same as the thought experiment that we just went through, but with a slight twist. In Cantor's diagonal argument, the rows each represent a single rational or irrational number between 1 and 0, and the columns each represent the consecutive decimal places within each number. In order to find out which of the two types of numbers are more numerous, Cantor's idea was that you can make a list of whole numbers with each row containing one whole number and one corresponding irrational number between 0 and 1, which would each be represented with an infinite series of digits. There's a big problem with this project, however, which is that you need to start somewhere. You first need a first digit, and then a second digit, and so on. When making an infinitely long list of positive integers, even though there is no last number, at least there is an obvious place to begin. We can start at the bottom with 1 when we are listing the positive integers, but when making a list of all the rational and irrational numbers between 0 and 1, there is no place to start and no place to end either. Cantor's way around this daunting problem was to say that the order of the numbers is not important, and so therefore all of the digits can just be random digits, and the numbers can also be placed in a random order. Therefore, we will end up with a matrix of random numbers that looks almost exactly like the matrix from the previous example. Keep in mind that what you see on the screen is just an infinitesimal tip of the iceberg. Just as in the previous example, the sample of visible numbers that you see is literally nothing when compared to the large number of potential combinations which could have been represented. Therefore, it should not be surprising at all that we could actually find an infinite diagonal that does not correspond to any particular infinite row. According to Cantor, if you go along the diagonal and you just add 1 to each of the digits, and you continue to do this forever, then you will end up with an irrational number with an infinite series of digits along the diagonal that cannot be found in any of the rows. This appears to be true because this infinitely long diagonal would have to be different from every single row by at least one digit. But even though it is true, it doesn't seem to make any difference because as I've already shown, it was already impossible to find an exact match between the diagonal and any of the infinite rows. Not only do we know for sure that it is impossible, we also know precisely why it is impossible. Hence, the alternative explanation that is provided by Cantor is merely a pseudo-explanation. Cantor's explanation is both redundant and misleading. Therefore, adding 1 to each digit along the diagonal is the equivalent of saying abracadabra and waving a magic wand, because this exercise does not really accomplish anything. Basically, all that you're doing when you add 1 to each digit is you are swapping the diagonal that is visible with one of the many hidden potential diagonals. There's nothing about Cantor's diagonal argument which requires additional explanation over and above what we have already covered in the primer thought experiment. The reason that the diagonal series of digits cannot be found anywhere in the columns is because it is buried in a vast sea of latent potential. This phenomena has nothing to do with the presence of or the position of a decimal place. But Cantor's explanation for why the diagonal irrational number cannot be found in any of the rows is that there must somehow be more irrational numbers between 0 and 1 than there are whole numbers. Contrary to Cantor's conjecture, there are not more real numbers between 0 and 1 than there are positive integers. You could just as easily and just as falsely claim that there are actually more real numbers 
then there are numbers between 0 and 1 with a slightly modified diagonal argument. But as I have mentioned earlier, I do think that Cantor was on the right track, because there does seem to be more depth to the concept of infinity than first meets the eye. Even though it is not meaningful to say that one infinity is larger than another infinity, infinity can still be multifaceted and multidimensional. The persuasive power of Cantor's diagonal argument depends on a hidden dimension. And when this hidden dimension is exposed, then his argument loses its cogency because it becomes clear that the result is always the same regardless of which two categories of numbers are chosen to make the comparison. The fact that we are comparing integers with decimals is only incidental. It also becomes clear that adjusting the value of the digits along the diagonal does nothing to the probability of finding a match. The probability was already zero prior to any adjustments, and it cannot possibly get any lower than zero. Now I recently gave the gist of this idea to a mathematician who I was having a real life conversation with, and his response was to get visibly upset. Because he teaches mathematics for a living, he thought that he should enlighten me on how mathematics actually works. He said that Cantor's diagonal argument cannot possibly be a deceptive argument because it is recognized as a mathematical proof. So simply recognizing an argument as a mathematical proof makes it immune to counterargument. He also said that my use of probability and statistics in this context was out of bounds because I am mixing ideas from different branches of mathematics. So presumably, integrating ideas from different branches of mathematics is forbidden? If this is any indication of the quality of the counterarguments that are available, then that doesn't speak well for mathematics as a profession. I'm putting this video out into the ether because I really want to know if there are any solid and cogent arguments available to contradict what I've just said.